and we're on. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our first workshop. Uh, my name is Chris Kidd, and I'm the director of Astro Aviation Consulting. For those of you that are unfamiliar with us, we're an aviation consultancy contracted by the CAA to provide a bespoke GA safety campaign. This evening, Matt Lane will be discussing loss of control. Matt is a CPL holder, flight instructor and examiner who is head of training at RAF Sport Aircraft and a current RAF tutor staff pilot on Oxford UAS. He instructs and examines for a variety of schools across Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire for PPL, LAPL, instrument ratings and aerobatics ratings across MEP, SEP and touring motor glider classes. I don't think I've missed anything out there, mate, have I? Um, he's also just been jointly awarded the AOPA Instructor of the Year Award for 2021. Over the course of the next 30 to 45 minutes, we'll be discussing loss of control, as mentioned. We will, however, break it down into four sections. In section one, Matt will cover what a loss of control event is. Section two will cover why we let this happen. Then finally, in section three, Matt will discuss how we can avoid it happening. The final, final section is handing over to you for Q&A. So please, throughout the workshop, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to pose any questions you may have, and then we'll sweep them up and cover them off at the end. Without further ado, over to you, Matt. Uh, right, thanks everybody. I can see the, uh, the numbers um, creeping up of people joining us on our participants. It's great to have everybody with you. Uh, welcome <coughs> from beautiful evening here in uh, in West Oxfordshire. Um, lovely, you can see out behind me. Thanks for people joining us online rather than being outside or in the pub or whatever. It's great to see so many people uh, joining us online. So it's really good. First thing to say before we get into this, uh, thanks for Chris for the introduction that, but <clears throat> this is not a, a lecture. This is not me uh, telling you what to do, what not what to do. So what this is all about is us just giving uh, some thoughts and things to that you can take away. You might take some of these and go, yeah, Matt, don't agree with you there. Um, you know, I, I'm going to discard that. You might go, yeah, Matt, oh, I like a bit of that. I might take a bit of that away and think about it. Or you might go, yeah, I really like that. I'm going to take that away as well. So this is what it's all about. It's just us putting some ideas, thoughts and uh, feelings on the table for you to take away and think about. Um, so uh, um, we, uh, we welcome you joining us in that spirit here as well. So before we get into some of the, the more talking bits as well, we want to make this interactive. So, um, and uh, you know, this is not an exam. We're not measuring uh, who says what in this. We can't see who answers what, so don't think that at all. This is just to stimulate some of the uh, debate. So we're going to start with a quick first poll. There'll be a couple more as we go through uh, the session as well. So here you go, poll one. Uh, what percentage of GA incidents or accidents do you think are attributed to loss of control? You could choose one of those, 10, 20, 40, or 55%. Um, I can't vote, Chris can't vote, um, but you all can vote on there as well. So we'll give it about 15, 20 seconds. And then uh, Chloe, uh, that's brilliantly driving the machines for us, will put up uh, some uh, results here as well. So we'll just give it another five, 10 seconds for people to, to have a vote, and then we'll see uh, what we've got. Right, let's have a look at the results. <clears throat> so, uh, the overwhelming number of people uh, went for 55%. <clears throat> well, interestingly, uh, the actual answer is, uh, I could tell you in the last five years, loss of control events counted for only, well, I say only, 20% of, uh, of GA accidents. <clears throat> so the 16% of you went for 20%, those are the ones who got it right. However, what some of you on there are quite right about is 44% of fatalities and 55% of serious injuries uh, were due to loss of control. So those higher figures definitely relate to um, serious outcomes of some of the accidents, shall we say. And the majority of these occurred during the approach phase of flight as well. So that's why um, some of the outcomes are quite serious because you know, there's lots of control events that we are seeing are generally happening during the approach phase of flight. And we'll touch more on that uh, as we go through. Great, thanks for your involvement there as well. So uh, 
what we'll do is move on to talk about, um, as we said, uh, what actually is a loss of control of them. So <clears throat> I'm going to read this bit out because it's important we get the definition right without lecturing you, like I said earlier. So loss of controls, an incident or an accident in which the pilot has temporarily or completely lost the ability to maintain control of an aircraft in flight. OK, so a couple of things to take away temporarily or completely, you've lost the ability to maintain control of your aircraft. And it typically results in an extreme deviation from the intended flight path. So you can see what type of things we're talking about with loss of control. We've seen it's a significant cause of accidents, um, and particularly because loss of control in proximity to the ground doesn't give you the ability or the time to sort things out before it becomes you know, a, a ground impact or, you know, or, or, or worse uh, in terms of you know, actually uh, an accident with your aircraft. <clears throat> and loss of control really as well, um, when we're talking about that loss of ability to maintain control of the aircraft, what we're talking about is the aircraft stalling, perhaps also developing into a spin or an upset is the terminology uh, that you might start to increasingly hear uh, coming down from some of the commercial training. You might start to hear it in the general aviation sector as well. Um, we can also have loss of control, not just when we're airborne, but when we're on the ground as well. So during the takeoff or the landing roll, but really today we're going to be primarily looking at loss of control in flight. But don't forget about those other loss of control uh, on the ground. Uh, that is a, a key part of it as well. Um, so what kind of thing are we talking about? To give you an example, well, one I personally witnessed very sadly um, was um, a gliding, motor gliding airfield as well. <clears throat> the individual suffered a cable break, so the glider pilots on will know all about that. Uh, nicely got the aircraft under control, <clears throat> went to turn back and complete a mini circuit. But um, instead of taking a landing somewhere, you know, perhaps less desirable on the airfield, the individual tried to get all of the way back and land in the perfect position alongside the launch point. Sadly, uh, they uh, they uh, suffered a low level stall spin incident on that final turn. They got low and slow and uh, basically spun the aircraft in alongside the launch point with, uh, with fatal results. So <clears throat> very sad event, but that's the kind of thing that we sometimes see as well. I've uh, had... Um, uh, to investigate some others as well. And, but what's common about all of these is the pilots involved, they were competent and experienced individuals, very capable individuals, and they thought they were in full control of their aircraft right up until events overtook them very quickly that they couldn't control, which ended up in an accident. So, you know, this is, this is something to think about here as well. These often aren't things that build up slowly, they can be things that happen fairly quickly to, uh, to overwhelm us. So that's, that's what we, we're kind of talking about. So we're going to move on to section two in a minute, which is about why, why do we let this happen to us? Or how does this happen to us? Okay, so um, this is all about the human in that. So we don't want this to happen, but it does happen to us. It can overwhelm us and happens. Um, I mentioned about the polls. We're going to know another quick poll here as well. <clears throat> so let's have a think about this. What happens to the stall speed in a 60 degree bank turn? <clears throat> Chloe's finally, uh, Chloe's gratefully put up three options for us there this time. So the stall speed reduces, increases, or stays the same. Calibrate your brains back to those principles of flight, uh, those old PPL exams all the way back just the old, well, <clears throat> whiteboards, chalkboards, OHPs, PowerPoint, whatever you happen to be taught with. And I'll give people again about five to 10 seconds uh, to have a look at that as well, which also gives me a chance to have a quick glug of coffee, hopefully. <clears throat> right, Chloe's whipped these things up, so there we go. So let's have a look at this again. You know, this is not to catch people out, not to trick people as well. So 84% of you uh, are actually in, in the right ballpark there as well. Uh, and basically, stall speeds affected by the square root of the load factor. I'm not going to give you an aerodynamics lecture. That's not what you want to give up your Wednesday evening for. 
but load factors two in a 60 degree bank turn. So square root of that, I can't do maths in public. I've got the answer written down here though. It's 1.4, yep. So the stall speed is gonna increase by 1.4 in a 60 degree turn, which can be quite significant, yeah. So you can see that example I talked about, that poor individual uh, in that glider, that's exactly what had happened to them. They uh, tried to crank it around in a very steep bank turn to line up with the run. And what had happened is the stall speed had increased. They got a bit slow in that turn, and the two had come together so that they'd suffered a stall spin event. That's exactly what happened to that individual, sadly. OK, thanks again for your involvement there as well. So let's have a look then at why loss of control events can creep up and take over our, you know, our, our day. So we've got a few uh, areas that we'd like to um, put to you to say well, these are things to think about. So uh, these are. Um, conditions. These are things that can build up such that um, you may suffer a loss of control of them. And then what we're going to do in the next section is give you some ideas or things to think about how we can perhaps mitigate these or, or, or try and remedy them. So the first thing uh, I've put up there is distractions. I can let you read it for yourself. Passengers, other traffic, um, airspace navigation, high load work airspace. So what this is all about is losing our focus on maintaining a slight, uh, safe flight path in the aircraft. So these other things are going to worry us. They're going to take up our capacity. Um, they're going to distract us from the primary task of flying the aircraft as well. <clears throat> I'm sure we've all thought about, you know, just how zapping passengers can be. It's great to take family and friends flying, but, um, you know, with cameras, chat, they can, they can really take up your capacity as well. Certainly looking for other traffic as well, especially with some of the excellent devices and all of the warnings and information available to us in the cockpit these days as well. Very easy to get sucked into uh, looking for that traffic that something's alerting us to. And we maybe don't keep up the scan going or, or whatever there as well. <clears throat> And the other ones there as well, navigation worries, high workload airspace. We all know the airspace in the UK is very congested, uh, very complex in places, especially in the south of the UK as well. Uh, we all are very well aware that uh, we want to avoid an infringement event as well. We're trying to take two. We might be dealing with weather or other traffic around there as well. So the workload can be can be pretty high on us as pilots there as well, especially if maybe we're not as current uh, as we would like to be because, you know, weather or the, the money that we uh, we can put for flying or, of course, COVID that we've had there as well. So, like I say, can be quite busy for us as well. So distractions is a, is a, is a key area. All right, let's move on to have a look at flying beyond limits or training. Now, <clears throat> I, I put it to us that um, we all, you know, want to be safe and diligent pilots here as well. Uh, and that's why, why you've joined us on the webinar tonight, which is great. So we're not going to deliberately uh, do this, I put to you. Um, what's going to happen is that we're going to be put in a position where we're flying beyond our limits or outside what we've been trained for or outside what we're competent for. Um, because uh, things have things have happened to, to put us in in that situation as well. So here's some of the things that we could uh, we could see there. Excess wind. We may have inadvertently gone into IMC. That's a whole topic for another day. Um, you know, the visibility can be worse than forecast or crosswinds can get up there as well. So these are all things that can challenge us. So where we're struggling to maintain a safe uh, flight path in the aircraft. And the third key area I'd like to, to put to you is uh, what I've termed in, in my work here, unexpected events. So these things like uh, engine malfunctions, uh, you know, bird strike, various technical failures with the aircraft, fire, thankfully very rare in light aircraft, although <coughs> electrical fires are not uncommon. I had a friend who had a, um, <coughs> uh, uh, an avionics set that uh, suddenly spontaneously uh, burst into flames and fire in, in the cabin there as well. Um, he did very, very well to deal with it while maintaining, uh, uh, maintaining control of the aircraft. 
uh, and air frame icing yeah especially as you get into winter uh, if especially if those of us with uh, imc ir ratings as well uh, the uh, uh, icing conditions may be a, a real threat for us as well but the key thing here is unexpected events often require fairly rapid um, but appropriate actions to be taken now if you delay action or take inappropriate action um, you know that's when things again can start to go wrong for us um, but why would we just delay or take inappropriate action well again it comes back to getting distracted during the emergency or getting overwhelmed as well some of you may have heard of uh, the startle factor as well which is that time that as a human you know uh, an event happens there's an engine failure there's a fire you know as humans we take a bit of time to assimilate that and think oh crikey what's going on what do i need to do here as well and that's time when control of the aircraft can start to degrade and then added up with other things uh, can can lead us to that loss of control that we uh, that we don't really want as well <clears throat> great example of this if you ever want to um watch uh, a video in is obviously sully and his ditching uh, in in the river there in his a320 brilliant film uh, and they they cover it really really well um, in there that kind of startle factor where they're sat there they hit the birds and they've got that little bit of time to figure out what's going on in which time <clears throat> the aircraft's already lost height lost power traveled quite a quite a distance and then uh, they did the great thing, of course, by keeping control of the aircraft by taking the uh, the ditching in the river rather than returning to the airfields. Brilliant film uh, to watch. Uh, I really commend it. And, you know, <clears throat> example of myself, um, unexpected event, really. You know, um, I bought um, a share when I was quite a bit younger in a nice little single seat uh, motor glider. I had a lovely local flight in it. Beautiful day and I was relaxed coming back into land. Uh, at the gliding site where the share was based. I wasn't that familiar with gliding airfields. And on the approach, I started to get quite concerned which side of the launch point bus I landed. There's lots of people milling around gliders, vehicles and stuff. And I suddenly thought, oh, crikey, you know, I'm going to mess up here. I'm going to get shouted at. I'm going to go in the wrong place or get in people's way. And I started worrying about this when I was watching what was going on and figuring out what's happened. And then suddenly there was this high-pitched whistling noise um, the aircraft didn't have a stall warner, but um, I looked down and I suddenly realised um, with some shock that I'd let the nose creep up, my speed had decayed, and basically, um, you know, I was starting to get the light buffet and towards the stall. And that whistling noise was the airflow. So you have the little, um, little air vents kind of down by your knees in the aircraft, a little Fournier um, RF motor glider, if any of you have come across them. And when you get a certain... Um, angle of attack and the aircraft and the airflow starts slowing down you get this whistling noise through the air vents as the airflow gets disrupted um, but that, luckily thankfully that whistling noise was enough to alert me carried out the good old standard store recovery and I landed safely and uh, you know so sort of went home to lick my wounds um, so um, yeah it, it can happen to us all but thankfully uh, you know something alerted me but that was a classic case of distraction uh, and unexpected things happening because different people in different places on the uh, uh, on the launch point so <clears throat> we've talked about what it is we've talked about how it can creep up and on us and that as well so so you know how can we mitigate this what can we do uh, to avoid uh, this happening um Again, let's have another little poll on this one. Again, just to get you thinking here as well. Slightly more tricky question. Again, we're not trying to catch you out. We're not trying to give you a tech question. <clears throat> but here's a question. What does the bottom of the green arc on your airspeed indicator indicate? And what does the bottom of the white arc on the airspeed indicate? Now, there is, I know, nuances on this with retractable undercarriages and landing configurations and all the rest of it. So we've kind of kept the question and the answers fairly simple in terms of language. But there's a few choices there as well. I'll give people a little bit longer on this one because I think you need about 15, 20 seconds just to absorb this one. I know I certainly did when I set this. So I'm just going to have a glug of coffee. We'll give you a little bit to absorb that and we'll see what answers we get.
Right, let's have a look. So what answers have we uh, got there? So everybody, majority of people went flaps up stall speed and flaps down stall speed as well. So uh, there we go. Excellent. Yeah, really good uh, choices from people as well. Yep. So bottom of the green arc is indeed the flaps up stall speed. Bottom of the white arc flaps down stall speed. Great answers from people on that as well. Often catches a lot of people out. <clears throat> Um, or perhaps you're all quickly on Google looking at a picture on your phone as well. I know what I, I know what I would be if I was uh, on one of these as well. But brilliant, um, great input. And you know, it's just, uh, you know, sometimes, especially if you're going to fly unfamiliar or different aircraft as well, just have a look at the markings on the airspeed indicator and what it's telling you, what speeds they're giving you as well. Um, I uh, test. At one particular club at an airfield, they've got four PA-28s, a variety of Warriors and Cherokees. Every single one has a different ASI presentation. Some are in knots, uh, some are in uh, miles per hour, uh, some have got different scales and things like that. So do take, take a bit of time to understand what the ASI is telling you in the aircraft you're flying. It's good advice I was given once. Right. So we talked about three areas there didn't we um of, as to why loss of control can creep up on us here as well so um, we've put them all in a red box here as well because it all comes under the human factors banner okay none of us set out to have an accident or an incident when we go flying that's just not not why we do it because most of us are doing it for leisure and for fun we all want to have a nice good day and a good time but you know, we're all humans. We've all got humans in the chain as pilots, passengers, ground staff, air traffic controllers. So things uh, things can and will go wrong as well. So um, so how can we avoid these stopping to us? Bearing in mind, we've got humans in, in the chain here as well. OK, so one of the things that I said uh, we're going to affect loss of control was distraction, wasn't it? That was one of the things uh, that I did mention. And you can see it in that first block up the top there as well. Well, uh, my offer to you really is that distraction, the best thing you can do to try and ease distraction is good pre-flight planning and preparation. What you want to try and do is get as much as your workload done um, before you get airborne as, as possible, really. You know, take good care of your passengers, get them briefed up, uh, you know, try and... Um, uh, you know, get all of the airspace routes study out of the way, get good weather forecasts and uh, things like that as well. So as much as you can do on the ground beforehand uh, will reduce your workload in the air as well. I know Rachel Caston from the Airprox board, where I've heard her speak a number of times, and this is something that Rachel really majors um, with Airproxes and things as well. She says the more you can do before you get airborne, uh, the more capacity it gives you in the air. And I think it I think it's really, really good advice there as well. Um, and the old one, you know, flying beyond limits or training. And this kind of leads into unexpected events and that as well is the old aviate, uh, navigate, communicate. Now, it's a really old one. We know that. We know it's a hackneyed saying, um, but it's still true. true. You know, if you have um, <clears throat> in just normal flying, or in an unexpected event, if you try and prioritize and work things in that order, it is it is really, really so important as well. It just slows everything down and just gives us the time uh, to, to, to take things in an, uh, you know, an appropriately um, prompt, but not overly rushed manner as well. Um, we talked about um, kind of a bit of stall spin and we had a few questions in the polls as well. So um, hopefully uh, most of us uh, can remember uh, a little bit about um, angle of attack and relative airflow and stuff like that. So <clears throat> here you go, a couple of little pictures again, not gonna give you an aerodynamics lecture. Nobody wants that on a Wednesday evening, but hopefully most of us can remember that while airspeed, weight, pitch angle, bank angle, all these things can change the critical angle of attack remains the same, okay? So if you exceed that critical angle of attack, that's when your wing's going to stall every time. 
Now, we talked about ASI markings there as well. Flying at appropriate speeds as given in your flight manual, pilot's operating handbook, if you've got one, should result in an appropriate angle of attack below the critical value. Okay, so fly the right speeds that are published. If you've got them, some LAA types might not have an A. Um, uh, you know, that should keep your angle of attack below the critical value. But you remember, as we talked about, those speeds on our airspeed indicator, they're valid for wings level and 1G. Yeah, and steep turns, as we saw, or loads more than 1G, you can get the stall occurring at much higher speeds than we might, than we might anticipate. Um, and the other thing to remember as well is that angle of attack's not the same as pitch angle. Um, so always try and visualize where you're pointing which is your pitch angle. If it's relatively close to where we're going, relative airflow, you can see there, that's kind of an indicator of a, uh, a, a you know, a smallish angle of attack away from the critical angle of attack. If you've got a big difference between where you're pointing and where you're going, that relative airflow, maybe it's slow speed in that aircraft at the bottom there, that's when you're starting to indicate uh, maybe a large angle of attack. So just something to think about. Um, <clears throat> When you're when you're flying around, especially at low level in the circuit, you know that's when you could say you've got a very nose high, slow speed situation. You know that could be when you're approaching that critical angle of attack as well. Um, <clears throat> moving back to our three um, boxes and our nice human factors box as well. Um, you know weather conditions we talked about as well. Um, you know, it all comes down to pre-flight planning as much as we can as well. Um, you know, <laughs> there is some amazing uh, resources out there as well. Sky Demon, Airbox, you know, for flight, all these kind of electronic flight bag uh, devices that we can get. <clears throat> Absolutely amazing weather radars and pictures, <clears throat> apps on your phone. You know, <clears throat> I've got an iPhone here. You know, I can get so much uh, weather information you know, at my hand in a field anywhere uh, with with that in terms of forecast, weather radars, windy, you know, there's all these apps <clears throat> and we can get so much information, but hopefully gives us um, the ability to plan our flight and decide or modify our flight so that we um, we avoid those, uh, those bad weathers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and lastly, unexpected events. Um, so, I talked about this, I talked about the Sully example there as well, but what, we, what we're trying to do is not let an unexpected event become an unexpected emergency. So uh, what we can do here is um, go through various what if scenarios. So if we can understand our aircraft and try and anticipate our responses and procedures and that, that's, that's going to be so vital in building our capacity uh, so when we are faced with an emergency or uh, uh, an issue as well um, we, we try and reduce that startle factor time i talked about as well so if we've already um, preconditioned our brain and thinking for some of these events as well lodged here in the back of our heads and back of our memory and when something happens our memory banks can kind of reach around that and think ah you know i've kind of thought about this before i've done something about uh, this before and it, it just buys us that capacity and thinking time but might be the uh, might be the key to success so <clears throat> one of the things i'll give you here then is a challenge so you know um over a cup of coffee or over a beer if you finish flying for the day uh, if you're in the crew room or with you flying uh friends or or colleagues or whatever next bad weather day or just after flight or just catching up or whatever um <clears throat> try and discuss some scenarios between yourselves and say what would I do or you know Dave what would you do Sarah what would you do you know how would you cope with this how do you think it would happen and just having those what if discussions can be really valuable for that pre-conditioning that I talked about as well so here's some of the things I could suggest that you talk about you know you've got a passenger that faints or is seriously ill door pops open on the takeoff roll just before you're lifting off you get a rough running engine at 400 feet on the climb out, partial power loss. Um, you come back to an airfield and you get a drone strikes your left wingtip during the rejoin. Or, you know, uh, somebody overtakes you uh, from behind in the circuit and an overhead joint. You know, all these scenarios, these things that could happen, you know, dream some of them up between yourselves, discuss them. And it'd be interesting to see what ranges of responses you get. And some people might come out with things and you think, oh, yeah, I like that. That's good. Or you think, oh, I hadn't thought about that or, or whatever. 
and this is um this is why we practice 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 things but um you know discussing some of these more odd scenarios as well can help train our brains uh for this as well um and it does happen as well i gave the door example as well i was doing a recent multi-engine flight in the duchess um which twin engine aircraft fairly old but still nice and capable some of you may have flown duchesses and you might know that the doors aren't great on the duchess as well we were literally just about to lift off and uh the door popped open uh on the one side as well you know i had a bit of the old startle factor and then kind of got my thoughts together and rejected the takeoff you know but um maybe you're flying an laa type or another type what about your you know an aircraft with a canopy what happens if your canopy suddenly lifts on the takeoff roll what how would you how would you cope with that what speeds would you fly would you land back on the runway would you turn back would you get a passenger to grab it would you, you know there's these things that you can you can think about you know uh, for your aircraft type, for your airfield, for your for your type of operation, it's it's really good stuff. Not to scare anybody, but um, again, it's all about that brain training. I suggest to you there as well. Um, <clears throat> so there, just to 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 wrap up there as well. Okay, so um, I've talked about um, what we what loss of control is. I've talked about how it can sometimes overwhelm us and creep up on us, and I've just given you some ideas and thoughts of things. But you could uh, you could think about in order to um, to remedy it or maybe help precondition ourselves to, uh, to deal with these events there as well. <clears throat> and remember, you know, my mantra, you know, this is not a lecture. This is not me telling you what to do and what not to do. These are things to think about that you can take away, adapt uh, uh, to your flying environment, your type of operation, your type of aeroplane. Uh, <clears throat> and it might uh, might just one day, uh, like I say, help you out when you do. Hopefully not, but if you do face something that tries to lead you down that path to a loss of control event, and hopefully uh, we can break the chain uh, and uh, before before it actually happens to to any of you there. Uh, thank you. Lovely. Thanks, Matt. It's interesting you mentioned the door popping open. Um, when I was learning to fly in a Cessna 152, the door popped open. Fortunately, I was with an instructor because I definitely had the startable factor. I hadn't. It was pretty solo. And then, you know, you're getting airborne on this thing, the, the door opens and I'm spending more time looking at the door than flying the aeroplane. So like I say, fourth there was instructor there. So there, we've all been there. Brilliant. Okay, so let's move on to some Q&A. Uh, thank you. We've got a couple of questions. Thanks to, for those of you who send those in. Uh, anytime we don't get to answer any more that come along, we'll uh, follow up via an article on our website. So please keep an eye out for that. Right. First question we've got in the question box is from Malcolm Ward. Thanks, Malcolm. I'm old enough to have taken my PPO when spin training was compulsory. <clears throat> this one definitely is for Matt. Yeah. <laughs> does, in your opinion, does the spin, current spin avoidance training adequately prepare pilots for less stable aircraft that they may fly after qualifying? So, yeah, cracking question, uh, Malcolm, there as well. So um, uh, most of you uh, will probably be aware that um, spin training, um, you know, um, used to be in the PPL syllabus like you said um, but um, but has now uh, now been taken out and the reason it was taken out was there was a view uh, from the regulators and from the training authorities that um, the, um, the, the the accident rate or incident rate during doing spin training during training was greater than uh, it would actually actually solve um, by by doing this this live training there as well. So they moved the emphasis to stall spin awareness training, which I think uh, you uh, you know very much picked up on there, Malcolm, saying that it's avoidance training there as well. So I <clears throat> I think that was the right thing to do because what we don't want to do is we don't want to scare pilots. We don't and. There is an argument that um, once the aircraft has entered a de fully developed spin, that it's almost in many cases too late because the loss of height near to the ground in particular will be so great that um, if you're into a fully developed spin, teaching students and people all about uh, standard spin or, well, that's another debate for another day, spin recovery is appropriate to your aircraft. Um, is kind of nugatory because it would almost be too late for them. So. I think it's right that we've gone into stall spin avoidance training to try and prevent people stalling the aircraft and developing the spin um, thing. However, I very much take your point um, that, um, 
yes, pilots might fly less stable aircraft that they may fly after qualifying as well. So where I think uh, there's a part in this is, is um, some schools and organisations offer sort of um, like post PPL training where you can go on and do advanced stalling or advanced spinning. There's some organisations uh, that go on. Uh, you know, and you can you can do like an add-on course. It's not a test or a qualification, but you can do an add-on post your PPL to experience some advanced uh, stall and and look at the spin and that as well. And uh, the people I know that have gone on to do those kind of courses um, have found that found that really really valuable. So I think there is a part for it, but I think post initial PPL when people have got a little bit of experience and knowledge is probably the time to do it as well. And um, uh, you know, I think the other thing as well is it's very, very important to get uh, training and experience on uh, on aircraft types that you may fly as well. If you're going on to fly more advanced types, like I don't know, a Cirrus or something like that, um, you, you need to get some good training on it. Equally, if you've learned on PA-28s and Cessnas and stuff like that, um, you know, it's and you're going to buy a share in an, an LAA type that may be uh, uh, more less stable or more demanding in its flying. Uh, you know, the LAA coaching scheme, getting experience from uh, from people with experience on those types, I think is is, is really, really important. I went and flew a, um, uh, a Eurofox, if any of you know those. It's a glider tone one Rotax engine, very nice machine, developed from the Kit Fox as well. But, um, you know, I, I do a fair bit of flying and that. But boy, this Euro Fox uh, demanded my attention on the ground. Uh, very sensitive, very twitchy. Um, it was a little bit of a crosswind and that as well. And uh, it, it took a hell of a lot of my capacity. Um, I was working really, really hard in it. Um, so um, it kind of gave me a bit bit of respect for, for, for some of these types as well. So a bit of a long answer to your question, but hopefully it's a, it's a very important topic. So uh, hopefully that's... Uh, that's satisfying, but thank you for asking it, Malcolm. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, Malcolm. Okay, we've got another question here from Tim Sylvester. Thanks for writing that one down, Tim. Here we go. So if angle of attack is so important, why aren't more light aircraft visited with angle of attack indicators? Um well, it's another cracky question. Uh, I mean, Chris, uh, you flew big fast jets as well. Um you know, um, I'm guessing, did you have angle of attack indicators in some of your aircraft? I'm pretty sure you did. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of bigger, I think some of the commercial ones do now in some of the head up displays as well, fast jets and things do as well. Not something we often have in, uh, in light aircraft really so much. Um, and I think that's a shame because I think as Tim was great question from Tim, um, highlighted, you know, angle of attack is really important. There are devices coming onto the market and indicators for cockpits as well. And I know some of the LAA fleets um, are, are, are fitting these warning devices, fitting these indicating devices as well. As um, electronic flight instruments and that become more, uh, more common, more available in our training fleet as well, I think it would be a good thing to see um, increased indications and awareness of angle of attack. I think it would be a really valuable thing uh, to, to introduce as well. Why has it not happened? I'm guessing it's because technology wise, um, it was always quite difficult to build and, and indicate these things. But as the technology for flight instruments is getting better and cheaper, I think it would be a, I think it would be a good thing to include more for sure. All right, thank you. Okay, question number three is from Tony Bullimir. Hope I've pronounced that correctly, Tony. As a lowly CRI, this is Tony, I have done a lot of refresher flying in the last year or so, and it seems to me that we would benefit from a biannual check, as in the USA, rather than a one hour with an instructor, <coughs> uh, Annam, which could be for any number of reasons. What are your thoughts on that, Matt? It's, it's a really, really cracking... Um question again Tony it's a really good point and it's been debated uh, as very much a hot topic as well I know the CA uh, to the instructor examiners through training common that give a lot of suggested uh, content to the hour with an instructor um, and um, it's often been debated that should we make it more of a, uh, a more of a check more of a mandated content uh, there as well um, the reality up to now has been that um, 
uh, EASA um, has, as uh, you know, we've had to follow that to, to keep it open, but it can just be any old, I say any old, any hour uh, with an instructor for any reason. It could be a night training trip, could be your IRR renewal test or, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but I think, I think you're right, Tony. I think there is um, a good case for, for mandating certain things to be shown. But um, at the same time, what we're, what we're always trying to do is to push from industry and from pilots is to deregulate. People want uh, less mandating, less restrictive regulations. So <clears throat> if we went the other way and mandated the content of the hour instructor, um, people could say, well, hang on, you're trying to deregulate. You're trying to leave it more open to people's judgment and interpretation um, and instructors on the ground to decide uh, what to do. Uh, why, why are you putting more gold gold plating on, which is the common <coughs> common you know, thing we often say to the CA and the regulators. So I, I think it's a tricky one. I, all, all I could offer to you is that um, I think uh, it, it's very important that the instructor and the pilot doing their hours instructor flight have a um, have an honest discussion between themselves, and uh, you know you focus on areas that are rusty and things where you can both get benefit out of them and and make sure people cover the basics. Um, you know if you're not very confident at stalling and stalling recoveries, you know avoiding that um, uh, you know is is not. Um, is not really the thing you know you want to you know get some confidence with your instructor uh, uh and there as well okay and um i'll just pick up as well so hopefully that answers your question tony um paul will hello paul uh i know paul well uh, so good to see you um on here as well yeah new new avionics instruments have angle of attack indicator built in yeah cracking uh paul thank you so it's worth a google and uh uh, a look there as well. Maybe you'd be fitting one to your uh, your one seven two next time I see you, Paul. Um, okay, fantastic. So, thank you ever so much for everybody for coming along this evening. Thanks ever so much to Matt. Uh, we're going to wrap up now, but I do hope you've taken something away from this, or at least it's made you have a think about how you can be safer in the air, how you could avoid those loss of control uh, scenarios. Um, you know, and if it does happen to you, how you can recover from it safely. Please do let us have your feedback. Uh, you can do this via email or through any of our social channels, or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, the recording, please let us know through the comments. Uh, please do follow us on social media or visit our website, astralaviationconsulting.com, where there's a whole host of useful safety information, not only about loss of control, but a whole bunch of other stuff as well, but they're there for you to watch and read. Um, well, there's another question from Michael Ashworth. Can I watch this back on YouTube? Yes, you can. Uh, give us a couple of days and we'll get it right out there. Uh, remember to check out our website for follow-up follow articles on loss of control. So Matt's done a whole bunch of stuff on there. That's on there now. We're going to be moving shortly into um, inadvertent IMC. So that's our next topic. So please do go to the website and keep your eyes peeled for that sort of stuff as well. And again, we'd love you to sign up so you can be on our mailing list. I'd like to finish with a final thank you, though, uh, to Matt for his insight and thoughts on loss of control. Uh, I think you'll agree that it was a very insightful and educational workshop. Thank you, Matt. So thank you to everybody and good night. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, fly safely and uh, look forward to catching people. If you see me at an airfield uh, around in person, please come up, say hello. And uh, yeah, coffee, black, non, uh, if you want to buy one. Thanks very much. Take care.